Watson Solomon, independent communication consultant and online journalist. He has more than 15 years of experience in journalism which include a decade with the Hindu newspaper. He has rich academic experience and worked as a head of media studies department in Hindustan College of Arts and Science Chennai. He has conducted several workshops in various institutions, delivered keynote addresses in seminars and chaired sessions in international conferences. He has authored and co-authored several books that include Plain Language in Plain English, Understanding News Media. He specializes in environmental science, eco-literature and media ecology. His areas of interest include chess, poetry and mathematics. Welcome to the UGC series of lectures on the environmental sciences. Today we are going to discuss eco-criticism, a relatively new discipline with special reference to media ecology. There was a time when human beings thought that planet earth was only meant for them. This is called anthropocentrism. So whatever human beings needed, they took it from the earth at the cost of plants, animals, insects, land, season and so on. But today, after the ecological crisis, man has had a rethink on this. Today, he has come to believe that a human being is not the end product of nature. He has come to realize that he is a part of nature and his interests have to be subordinated to that of the interests of earth. Only then can nature and human beings and plants and animals. So let us first look at a brief introduction about eco-criticism. Media ecology limits itself to the study of the effects of the media environment on humans. I would like to expand the scope of media ecology to include the study of the impact of technology on the natural environment. There can be no printing press without paper and paper, excuse me for stating the obvious, comes from trees. The raw material for every medium comes from nature. So the study of the impact of the printing press and other media on the natural environment is also a legitimate part of media ecology. In this paper, I would like to show that the study of media ecology in literature is in fact a necessary part of the oikopoetic method. The oikopoetic method is actually a combination of poesis and the oikos. But before we look at that, I think we need to look at the eight factors which come from Tulkapyam, an ancient Tamil text. The human act as described in the ancient Tamil text Tulkapyam has eight factors, doing, doer, object, place, time, instrument, recipient and end. For example, in advertising, that is a human act, the advertiser creates an advertisement at a certain time and place using certain tools for a target audience to achieve a certain goal. Though media ecology is concerned with the instrument medium, it can be argued that each of the factors is a medium. Now we can also look at uh, some other examples like uh, reporting. You can do that as an exercise. For example, if you take uh, reporting, you will have, you need to have a reporter and then you need to have report. There is a time for it to be written, a place where it is read out and then the instrument, the audience and eventually the benefit. Any human act can be resolved into these eight factors. Now we come to media ecology. Media ecologist Neil Postman lists five things we need to know about technology. First, he says that technology is not an unmixed blessing. This is a common place. Generally, people know that every technology will have plus and minus. This is very common. So this is the first principle that uh, Neil Postman talks about, though it is commonplace. The second principle is very interesting because what he says is the pluses and minuses are not equitably distributed. Second, the advantages and disadvantages of new technologies are never evenly distributed among the 
population. The third principle that Neil Postman talks about. Third, embedded in every technology is a powerful idea. So, you have a new medium. Now, this medium has pluses and minuses and these pluses and minuses are not equitably distributed. But each medium will come with a powerful idea which Marshall McLuhan says the medium is the message. Many people who look at the medium uh, only look at the content. There is a television set before us and we do not know what the television set does to us. We are only interested in the content. For example, we have cartoons or television serials and so on. But even a television set that is switched off restructures society. That is why Marshall McLuhan says that the medium is the message. We cannot ignore the medium without the message. Now, he says that the content is a juicy bone that distracts the watchdog of the mind. So, we should be very much aware of the technology, the medium that we use to propagate our messages. Now, Neil Postman's fourth principle is that technological change is not additive, it is ecological. Now, this is a very interesting principle because generally we think that the media is additive. See, first we had the radio and then there was uh, the television and then we had the internet. Now, it is not radio plus television plus internet. Now, after the television came, though the radio is a part of the television set, it is a different society that television has created. Our education system has changed, our uh, political campaign has changed, our uh, advertising method has changed, everything has changed with television. Now that we have the mobile phone, there is a reordering. Postman says in the year 1500, after the printing press was invented, you did not have old Europe plus the printing press, you had a different Europe. After television, America was not America plus television, it was a different America. Now, that is a television set which has recreated our society. It gave a new coloration to every political campaign, to every home, to every school, to every church, to every industry and so on. Now, Neil Postman's last principle is supposed to be the most important. It says, media tends to become mythic. By this he means that the media becomes naturalized. We call this the naturalization of technology. Now, if you ask a child to draw a nature painting, what he or she will do is, she will draw maybe a river, a crocodile, there may be a house. Now, house is not nature, it is culture. And then there will be a well, a well is also not nature. There may be birds, but on a telephone pole. And you know telephone poles are not nature, they are culture. So, this uh, all these cultural activities become naturalized. Now, today every student, if you tell the student not to carry a mobile phone, it becomes uh, a problem. The child thinks that it has been born with a mobile phone. So, that is the fifth principle of Neil Postman. Now, I think we can move on to the oikopoetic method. Nirmal Selvamani's oikopoetic method applies the principles of oikopoetics to specific texts. It seeks to identify the oikosis in a text. Oikos is the Greek term for habitat. A very close relative of this term oikos is thinai. The ancient Tamils, they divided society into five habitable zones, four habitable zones and the fifth one is desertic. So, likewise, the oikos, there are three types. You have the integrative types. Uh, that approximates to Athenai, very harmonious with nature, culture and the sacred. The second type is the hierarchic. The hierarchic, there is an order. You have a, a God at the top, the kings in the middle and then the inhabitants at the bottom and below that we have the animals and plants. So, Nirmal Salomani uses the oikos to look at uh, society, literary texts, the media and any cultural activity. So, what he wishes us to do is to identify the oikosis in a text. He also wants us to establish the relation of one oikos and other oikosis. And thirdly, to compare the oikos of one text with oikosis of other comparable texts. Now, 
we need to look at some very good examples. Our Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, he wrote a short story called Wrong Man in Workers Paradise. In that story there is a picture, you know a picture is a small uh, a kind of a pot which you use to draw water from a well or lake or pond. Now in this particular story you find that there is a girl who is in workers paradise and then there is a lazy fellow, people thought he will go to hell but by some mistake he has been put in workers paradise, not only paradise but workers paradise. Now there are some passages which I would like to read out from that particular story. Every day they met and every day he said to her, girl of the silent torrent, give me one of your clay pictures, I shall draw pictures on it. Now the, the picture that you use is mainly meant to draw water, but what he says is he will draw pictures on it. She yielded at last, she gave him one of her pictures. The man started painting, he drew line after line, he put color after color. When he had completed his work, the girl held up the picture and stared at its sides. Her eyes puzzled, brows drawn, she asked, what do they mean, all those lines and colors, what is their purpose? The man laughed, nothing, a picture may have no meaning and may serve no purpose. I think this is the most important, uh, if, uh, if you will permit me to say a message, this is the most important uh, significant message in the whole story. He says a picture may have no meaning and may serve no purpose and that is its ultimate purpose, that is the purpose of art. As Oscar Wilde said, all art is useless, it is because they are useless we call them art. We use a pot to draw water from the well. We draw some pictures on the pot and we place it on the shelf and we admire it. The picture in the women's oikos, the oikos as I have told you is the habitat, the thinai in Tamil philosophy, is just a storage medium. You can store water in a picture, but it is expressive in the man's oikos. Why is it expressive? Because the man is not using the pot to draw water, he is using the pot to draw pictures. Since by mistake he was placed in workers paradise, his oikos was sure to threaten the oikos of workers paradise. That is a beautiful story which I would not like to spoil in the retelling. We can move on to the next example, it is called anecdote of the jar. This poem called anecdote of the jar was written by Wallace Stevens. In Tago's short story there was no conflict between the cultural and the natural environments. In Stevens poem there is a conflict, but what is this conflict? It is a short poem, the poet comes from Tennessee and what he says is, I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and off a port in air. It took dominion everywhere. The jaw was grey and bare, it did not give of bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. We shall take a break now. Welcome back after the break. We had just seen uh, Wallace Stevens anecdote of the jaw. Now we shall see what are the implications. We can see that the introduction of the jar as storage medium is not additive but ecological. It is not Tennessee plus jar, but a different Tennessee. Now any new medium that comes in, what it does is it restructures society. You just imagine uh, India before radio or even before the printing press, how was India? Likewise every country, any new technology that comes in alters its landscape, alters its cultural mappings and even uh, alters the sacred dimensions. It is not Tennessee plus jar, but a different Tennessee. Postman might say it is the surrender of culture to technology. Now we will look at another example, a very interesting one. It is Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats. The urn, meant for storing the ash of the dead, is exploited as an expressive medium. 
the poem may be seen as an interaction between the external and the internal context. In the stanza beginning, heard melodies are sweet. We are taken from the real world into the virtual. Heard melodies belong to the real world. The melodies that we cannot hear but still can enjoy are on the urn. In the stanza beginning, who are these coming to the sacrifice? We are taken from the world within the poem to a world without. Keats speculates about a little town that is not on the urn. What little town by river or seashore? Or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn. And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. So, that was a wonderful poem by John Keats. Now, we move on to another example. This is about a pond by Richard Church. This is a sonnet, a sonnet has 14 lines. Some fool has hurled a stone into the pond, where I liked looking at the clouds, the stars, the underside of leaves, the little wars of midge and feather, or those between my fond and asher moods. For the mind will seek a mirror in any surface that reflects the sky, and for a moment shows eternity shining through time as courage shines through terror. Now I see nothing, the oracle is fled. The little waters where all meaning sits, in miniature lie shattered. I watch instead the mirror in my mind, where faith renets the images that I have always known. Survive the fool and his disturbing stone. Here we have the clash of two oikoses. Oikoses are habitats, the poet's habitat and the fool's habitat. The fool just loves to create a splash in the waters. But faith helps to renet the poet's oikos. Oikopoetics actually tries to comprehend the meaning of a poem at three integrated levels human, nature, and sacred. The sonnet easily lends itself to the oikopoetic method. Now we can move on to another example the well. Postman tells us that technology becomes mythic. We no longer look at the alphabet and number system as a product of a culture. They appear to us as old as the hills and therefore an indispensable part of nature. The making of a pot requires some clay. Nature seems to gladly provide it. The digging of a well involves violence against nature, but nobody seems to look at it that way. The well over the ages has become mythic and therefore a part of the landscape. My poem, The Ballad of the Frog, attempts to portray the conflict between the sacred and human need. A temple is raised and a well is dug. Here is the poem. For many years, counting from one to nine, no single drop of rain from the skies fell. So townsfolk raised to the rain gods a shrine, and bade the priest cast out the evil spell. The river that used to run through the town had been dammed by a king beyond the dell. No chance could make the smiling skies to frown. The priest was reborn, a frog in the well. Along came a man, water to divine, with divining rod that can secrets tell. He walks along a curve, along a line, but cannot figure where the waters dwell, till he steps into the shrine in the town, for there the rod begins to spin like hell. All smile for joy, but only one did frown. The priest was reborn, a frog in the well. To dig a well, they needs must raise the shrine. Already they can hear the water swell. The priest loses his school and calls them swine, and for the last time rings the temple bell. He then begs upon his knees like a clown, but they raise the shrine and dig a deep well. He goes mad and runs up and down the town. The priest was reborn, a frog in the well. He looks up at the skies that would not frown, and clasps the idol of the rain god well. He jumps into the well, himself to drown. The priest was reborn a frog in the well. Now you can see how a well as a storage media has had an impact on the priest and on the villagers there. Our final example is the dam and you know there is a dam on the river Narmada. The park can only store a little water. The dam, thanks to our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, is still being considered as the temple of the future. 
Why are environmentalists against it? Allow me to state my position in verse. The poem is called River Narmada. There are two parts to it. We begin with part one. No more a child to mother glad runs the river into the main, but dancing flows like serpent sad, serpent caught in a piper strain. The snake dances not forever, but calls up in a basket soon. So within a dam the river curls up in a serpentine swoon. The wind sighs over the river tame, gathering clouds darken the skies, but is the serpent ever tame, a snake hisses but never sighs. If the earth quakes, then the dam breaks, the waters foam like killer brew, and here the peaceful hamlet wakes, each drop will prove a venom true. The skies cry out in thunderstorms, and clouds fire a volley of rain. Once more a child to mother's arms, the river runs into the main. The River Narmada, Part 2 Citizens of a rural clime, on the banks of the Narmada, awake tonight with thoughts sublime, hold the river goddess in awe. All earthen lamps they brought now sail, like fire-laden boats upon the stream. All eyes follow the blazing trail, eyes wrapped in visionary gleam. In silent prayer they shut their eyes, and with them hymns the wind tonight. Earth, water, air, fire, and the skies, in peace the elements unite. River goddess, we seek your peace. Our lowly lives you must sustain. The fire-laden boats float on with ease, and sail into the longing main. We have come to the concluding part of this lecture. Uh, we began with eco-criticism and then we spoke about media ecology and then looked at concrete examples. A poet can do no more than create an aesthetic awareness about the consequences of media technology, not only on the media environment but also on the natural environment. We have seen that the pot has become mythic. The well has also received the same status, the dam is yet to. There is much talk about linking rivers. The very idea, let alone the impact on the environment, will annihilate the idea of diversity. Do you remember the rhyme, if all the seas were one sea? Now, we need to understand that uh, we love our identities. Every student loves to have his name called out by the teacher. Now, if a teacher remembers a student's name, the student is very happy because it gives him an identity. Now, when we link rivers, we see what happens. The Ganges has an identity, the Narmada has its identity, the Kaveri has its identity. Now, you, if you mix all these up, what happens to its identity? There will be a bit of a Kaveri in the Ganges, a bit of Ganges in the Yamuna and so on. Do you think we can allow this? I think though we are communitarian beings, each of us has a role to play as an individual being. Likewise, each river must be permitted to have its identity. Of course, the name was given by human beings. Now for the rhyme, this is a nursery rhyme, it is a very interesting rhyme and it has a moral too. If all the seas were one sea, what a great sea that would be. If all the trees were one tree, what a great tree that would be. See, you look at the imagination of the poet. He wants all the seas to be one sea, like the linking up of the rivers. He wants all the trees to be one tree, because today we like things which are big. I think here I need to introduce a book called uh, Small is Beautiful by E. F. Schumacher, because today we like to have everything big. We want mega technology. We are not happy with small things. So this poet, he wants all the seas to be one sea and he wants all the trees to be one tree. He believes that if all the trees were one tree, that would be a great tree. And if all the axes were one axe, now this is where the cultural element comes in. See, we have seen the seas. Seas is nature. Trees are also nature. But now the axe has made its appearance. The axe is a sort of a medium which you use to cut down trees. And if all the axes were one axe, what a great axe that would be. 
and if all the men were one man now again human beings we want to be very strong we want to be gullivers what a great man he would be and if the great man took the great tax now human beings are part of nature but they are also part of culture now this great man he takes the great tax and cut down the great tree and let it fall into the great sea what a split splash that would be now what is the role of human beings some say that we have to take care of nature who are we to take care of nature nature takes care of us we forget that now you see what this great man has done what he does is how does he relate to nature see that is the basic point that we need to remember see he wants all the seas to be one sea the sea is large but he is not happy with that he wants all the seas put together to have a very large sea which even the earth cannot hold now he wants to put all the trees together and make it one big tree okay this is nothing wrong with this because he wants a large sea and a large tree nothing wrong with that but then he wants to put all the axes together and make it one big axe now why because man is essentially destructive what he thinks is we need to look at uh, nature culture and the sacred now i think we can move on to the assignments discuss the principles of media ecology with special reference to the cell phone what are the types of oikoses depicted in television advertising marshall mcluhan's famous equation is the medium is the message explain the equation with an example thank you